Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. We are back, and Amy Dumas has joined us. Amy, thank you so much for being with us, and this should be a, a very interesting hour or so. You're making me nervous. I thought I was catching up with an old friend, you and then uh, are... you tell me I'm in the, the hands of the fans. Yeah, you are. You're, 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 you've been in the hands of a lot of fans. You just didn't know it, uh, <laughs> all those young 14-year-old boys back in the day. But nonetheless, we digress. You know, we're not, I'm not interviewing Liberace here. I'm interviewing Lita. I'm so happy about your Hall of Fame uh, in, induction. So congratulations on that, first of all. I want to. Thank get... you. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if, if or when that they would decide the powers that be would decide to hand that over to me. So I was legitimately uh, surprised and excited. But you got to know that you're not the first female with a tattoo to go into the WWE Hall of Fame. So you have some inside information, first visible, then maybe. There's some... Yeah. No, it was it was visible. Okay. Yeah, it was. This is not naughty. I, would I, thought, never, I thought you were going there already. No, no more. No, it's coming. It's called <laughs> foreplay. It's like I have a whole theory about these matches that have no foreplay, and everybody just wants instant gratification without having a match. So I've been blogging about comparing uh, the build of the match to foreplay. It's All right, a, so, we'll, so we'll hang out in a top wrist lock for a minute. So who is the first female that has a tattoo as well. It has to be Mae Young. And Mae Young has a, had, had, bless her heart, a little tattoo on her forearm. On yes, top. she did. You're right. You're right. So I don't An know. old sailor tattoo. Yeah. I didn't, hey, I don't, I didn't prepare for that, but it just came up. So, you know, what do you do? Hey, I, I was uh, on the phone this week, uh, a few days ago, talking to Stone Cold. You know, Stone Cold and Chris Jericho, as you well know, have podcasts here on Podcast One. And, uh, Austin led the way, then Jericho came in, then here I came, the little, little chubby trailer hitch coming around behind and trailing along. Uh, but we've been number one in multiple countries on multiple weeks, so I think we're doing okay. But I asked Austin, I said, hey, uh, I'm talking to, uh, to Amy this week coming up on a uh, podcast. He says, oh, that would be good. I, I said, uh, she's just getting back from Nicaragua. And he said, quote, Jesus Christ, Nicaragua, what the hell is she doing there? So my first question in honor of Stone Cold is, how did you pick Nicaragua to spend some of your free time or your off time or your other time? Why Nicaragua? I have my, my second home is in Nicaragua. And it's on the beach, the Pacific coast, the southern Pacific coast. My, my views are to Costa Rica. So topographically speaking, it's the same as Costa Rica. People don't seem to be too scared of Costa Rica. It's mainly all that, um, you know, landmines and Sandinista stuff, I think, that maybe deter people a little bit. From yeah, the what the hell. A few mines. we got to move but on. But uh, that's been since the 80s, and it's, it's beautiful there, and, and I've met so many awesome people there from the country. Uh, I, I just, you know, I've always been an explorer. It's kind of what brought me to, be, to become a WWE superstar. But I was exploring around and then I retired life and decided to, to buy a place there. I wanted to be able to keep up my Spanish chops and wow. and have somewhere else just to, to relax and, and go surfing. You're a renaissance woman, a true <laughs> renaissance woman, no doubt about it. 
uh, when did you find out about the Hall of Fame induction? They called me, and I was down in Nicaragua. And it was funny because I'd been down there for maybe two days, and Steph calls, and she's like, or Steph texts me, and she was like, the office is trying to get in touch with you. They can't get in touch with you. And I was like, that's weird. You know, I mean, you're getting in touch with me just fine. And then I thought, well, they probably called me, and I don't have my, you know, calling plan to, to work intentionally. You know, I was like, I've got my email and iMessage, and, I, and I'm in touch enough. Yep. with whatever I need to know. And geez, it's been 48 hours, and, you know, I'm not calling back somebody at the office, and, you know. How dare you? Place is going awry, yeah. So I was like, what? No, I was like, just chilling out here on my hammock, man, at my house in Nicaragua. I mean, she so was like, sure, I'll give them a call. And she's like, okay, well, I don't know what it's regarding, <laughs> but they just want to tell you, uh, ask you something. And I was like, there's a bunch right, of well, bunch of guys. I know that you know what it is, but uh, I can tell uh, the way you yeah, phrase yeah, that. Yeah, you're I, not going to. Uh, these guys you know, are, these guys are. Driving all over the road now, they're trying to envision Amy just relaxing, kicking back in a hammock in Nicaragua, with that thong that th- that yeah. thong stretched tightly above the uh, well- waistline, like the we used to shoot every Monday night on Raw during the Attitude Era. But B, I digress again. So, uh, yeah, so we're out of the top wrist lock into like the first, you know, like right before the heat. Is that what just happened? I got my shine. And yeah, just- yeah, that's it. That's it. We're telling a story here. And so <laughs> Stephanie's been trying to, uh, they've been, they, who the hell they are, they have been trying to get a hold of you. Stephanie texts you, and then you? I call my, my good friend Mark Carano, who worked at the office, and I hear is a star on, a, on television. Oh, yeah, day. yeah. He's even changed his hairstyle. He's got that short, parted down the middle look, you know. It's, it's like, it's the, his, it's the shimp shortcut. He's uh, got his camera-ready look on. Yes, he's, he does. Yeah, blue blue. Male counterpart to the superstars or the, the divas on, on television. Uh, Mark Corrado called me and said he had something to ask me, and it was if I would accept the you know honor of being in the Hall of Fame. So that was that was exciting news down there. But it was odd, I'll tell you, because I'm so removed down there in Nicaragua. And, and my life in general is pretty chill, and I'm just fairly removed. But if there's a way for me to be more removed, it's when I'm down in Nicaragua. Did the folks in Nicaragua celebrate with you? Did they have a little Nick, Amy Day or anything good? Tell no, them, no. Tell I was them? by myself. I oh. just checked the times for the tides for the, my next surf session, and I was like, well, I guess I'll call my mom. Yeah, and go back to the old, go back to the old hammock. Yeah, and I called her, and I told her, and she was like, well, that's really great. I went in and checked your mail, and I watered your plants, and everything seems fine over there. And I was like, all right. You got it made, kid. Well, great, thanks. But it was it was like she seemed excited but not real she was like, Okay, that's she's like, That's great news. Okay, everything's fine at the house and I was like, Um yep. All right. Well, see you later and I was like Gotta well, go. That, that that was that. I guess I'll have to just keep my celebration until the actual night. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Save it up. Uh hey, what's harder? Picking out a dress, uh, writing your speech or selecting someone to induct you into the W W Hall of Fame? Wow, I, I'd say that's kind of like people saying, "What's harder, or you know, or what's more important, working out or eating right?" You know, it all, it all just kind of goes hand in hand. Yep. Um, Can't win for losing on a speech. Take it from me. I, I wrote one about ten times, and I even uh, carried it out to the podium and said, "Screw it." And but you know, I'm not advocating you ever be uh, diversive or of the counterculture. Uh, like some of us have been known to be, or accused of being, and so you know, because you could wind up on the wrong side of the law. Hmm. So, well, yeah. If I don't feel good about it, though, that is always option C. Yeah. I've just done the first draft. I've kind of went through the, a chronological timeline of who I wanted to thank, which then brings up stories along the way. Sure. Does, does that sound like a decent approach? Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think thanking people and getting more people involved is good because none of us made it without the help of others. And there are a lot of good, I know a lot in my career, a lot of really good people along the way kind of show me, a, no, I don't turn there, go over here, or let me, you know, let's give it, you know, they help me in a lot of different ways. So that's cool. So right. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. JR, you're always one of my supporters from the very, be- well, not the very beginning, but as soon as we met, back from my first visit up there at Titan Towers. Titan. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. So, writing the speech, write what you want, pick out you know, whatever you wear to look cool. I remember what you wore in that little business suit you wore to my meet with our meeting we had in uh, in uh, you look like a Mary Kay salesperson. You were all that's, dressed. That's the up. only business suit I've ever had. Yeah. Oh yeah. You were a business boy. You were 
you were business all the way. And uh, our first meeting, my office in the fourth floor of the Titan Towers. Golly. And now I'm out here in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma where they filmed the last picture show, I think. I st I've been sitting here talking to you and grazing out the window from time to time. I have yet to see anything move. Wind or cars or humans. I may be in some kind of alternate universe here in Oklahoma. If I don't see you at New Orleans, we've had a hell of a talk so far. Uh, so there's that. Uh, when did you become a wrestling fan? Okay. When I, be I became a wrestling fan in kind of an odd way. I, I went from not being familiar at all, not having any friends or anyone that watched wrestling, to having some friends that watched wrestling. I was like, well, I don't, you know, I'm not familiar with that. And then as soon as I watched it, I was a fan, but I was a fan in a way that I was like, wow, that looks like a really cool job. Mm -hmm. And I'd sit and watch it, but I would watch it as almost like I was looking from their perspective, if that's even possible. Yeah, that makes Having sense. no yeah. back, you know, history, knowledge or anything. And I was like, man, it's like a, almost relating to them from a, not from a fan perspective, like... My friends were cheering and doing stuff, and I was going, that's interesting. That's interesting how that played out. That's interesting how they're yeah, portraying they, this. And they that got was what, it. more what led me yeah. to my quest to, to want to become a wrestler in the first place. It was almost kind of like a student from day one as mm -hmm. opposed to a fan. Yeah, it's an interesting lifestyle, obviously. I read, uh, kind of ties into this, I think. Uh, I've been known for my masterful segues in my lifetime. Uh, but I was young then. Back when I was back in my day, as Tony Gray was set catering, uh, I read. Where, I press a, back in my day. Yeah, back in my day, back in my day, where, back in your day, were you a roadie on the, before you got in wrestling? Were you actually a roadie for a rock band or a, some traveling musical show? I was. I I played in pro project bands with people, so I was in people's some touring bands, side project bands, and I also roadie with a couple bands. So I, the pirate life has been in my veins from a very early age. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to, you got to do more than be a roadie. And I, I, I also, you know, I'd forgotten because I think they sent me a tape that you were trained by Dory Junior, Dory Funk Junior, for a while. Is that that's that's accurate, right? That is accurate. Yeah, I think that is where the tape that finally made its way up to Titan was was from. He was doing the Funkin' Conservatory with some of the startups that were already under contract. Then that plan switched, but he started his own, and I was like, well, he knows the formula. Yeah. He knows what they want yep. out of their their talent, and so I, I think that's probably the best source to go to right now. So right. I, I, signed, I was already with ECW at the time, but I signed up to go train with him You're you know, on my own dime to just you know go as, as far as I could. You're a very logical thinking chick with a big tattoo on her arm you really are you're deep i feel like george carlin now i think i just had a little moment when you started watching and you knew that hey this thing might be interesting because i kind of like the road and i'm athletic and i'm i think i could do this i really believe i could do this you know and i don't think anybody should put limitations on themselves anybody listening god you know for me to be a fat guy from oklahoma with a southern accent and three bouts of bell's palsy and have a career she can be christmas I could do that. If I did that, what what can't you do? Well, that's what I like. Absolutely. What the hell, you know? So did anyone got one talent or one angle or one show really seal a deal as far as you liking the business? Yeah, absolutely. I was already kind of starting to watch it. I was attaching to people. I was, I was seeing how storylines played out. Rey Mysterio was the number one talent that's but stuck out to me. I was like, I mean, the Mexican wrestlers in general, I liked the mystique behind that, them being able to be so expressive with having their face covered. And that, I mean, Rey Mysterio was just light years above and beyond all of the other wrestlers in being able to portray emotion. Are you talking about watching him in WWE or are you watching him in Mexico? Oh, sorry. And, and he was in, he had just come, they started using him in WCW. Okay, okay. You know, so I was, and that, so that was the main wrestling that I would watch and be really inspired in a physical way, mm -hmm. and then an emotional way, um, that very controversial storyline with um, Kevin Sullivan and 
Benoit and Nancy, it, what was going on. And I was like, well, that's not right. Well, she's not supposed to be with him. And why? The, he looks like he's really mad. He might really be mad. You know, and yeah. I found myself, I caught them. I'm like, oh, I'm hooked. I'm in, you know. Yeah, that was some cruel. Hey, that was some, you know, unfortunately, some really weird karma, uh, irony, whatever, in that storyline. Golly. Oh, absolutely, that, uh, that, uh, absolutely eerie. Uh, ooh, yeah, you th- think about it. Ooh, I want, let's go someplace else. Uh, so Ray Mysterio was your guy, and I can see, uh, did you see him do the Hurricane for the first time? Because I got a lot of Twitter questions we'll get, we're going to get to as we go on here from our loyal Twitter followers. You have yours, I have mine, and uh, we have more than we probably deserve. But nonetheless... People were wondering if you if you were influenced by Ray, and regarding the her Corona or the Lita Corona, as I tried to call it some Monday nights. Yeah, absolutely, and many many fans after that called it that for many years because of that. But yeah, definitely, Ray Ray was the first person that I saw, and from there, I mean anything in general, because I am very logical and, and kind of a, I have a pretty insatiable thirst for knowledge so if i see something i like or something that interests me such as ray doing the hurricanrana yeah. i'm going to go find out where he did it where he, where that comes from who else is doing it what it you know so from there i'm watching countless hours of mexican wrestling footage and, and tapes and anything i can get my hands on and that's what led me to go down to mexico to start training because i was like those this is not just like you know a, a gimmick those these mexican wrestlers are really from mexico you know as far as i know <laughs> you know there could yeah. be some russian in the mask under yeah. there but they're just calling them mexican wrestler and as i was right. doing my research i was like no they're really from mexico so if that's what i want to learn i guess that's where i should go yeah there you go well that's cuts to the chase pretty smart thinking so you went to mexico and you uh started training now tell me this story because i'm it's it's just strange to me not st- and strange may not be the best word, but, you know, hell, I'm not really a, actually a broadcast journalist. I'm a wrestling announcer. There just aren't a lot of need for wrestling announcers these days in my world. You go to Mexico. Uh, do you go alone to Mexico? Yes. And, then, okay, then when you got, did you already have a contact there before you left that was going to help help you along, or did you go there cold turkey? I, I went there cold turkey. God. I was told... That, Mex- that, that Lucha Libre was bigger than American football, um, you know, in Mexico, and all I need to do is just get there, and it's, you know, that's all anyone's ever going to be talking about, and, and every, people are going to, there's just going to be wrestling matches all over the place, and you're just going to find it once you get there. So yeah. I, whoever said that, I was like, okay. So you believe enough. you believe that? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you, you know, I've had those magic mushrooms before. You think crazy stuff? Well, nonetheless, I'm kidding you. Uh, I, uh, that took a lot of courage because I know we went to Mexico city to do raw because I was actually in segment 11, which we're going to talk about here in a minute about your segment 11. I was actually in one of my segment 11s because, you know, big stars like me are so, uh, gifted athletically and have such, you know, appealing physiques. Uh, we are in segment 11 on multiple occasions. It's multiply organic when a guy like me gets in segment 11. And uh, we go to Mexico City to do Raw, and they don't, they don't want us to leave our hotel. They, we put in, they put us in a hotel. There's, they actually have extra security there. We never left the hotel. I flew from the airport to the, uh, to the airport, obviously, duh. We drove to the hotel in a car that was waiting on me. Stayed in the hotel till I went to Raw. I did my little gig at Raw with John, as John Cena's sidekick tag team partner. And then back to the hotel, and that was it. And the next day I flew home. So you're, they said, oh, it's dangerous. Uh, they'll, Senor, they'll take your Rolex. Oh, it's not real. I got it from Plowboy Frazier. No, it is real. But, you know, then you're down there by yourself, for God's sakes. I can't even imagine that. Was it calmer then, or, or did you just have not know? Was it? I think I just had to, uh, you know, a bunch of kid power. There was actually a government advisory, like about four days before I left to go to Mexico, that said nobody 
no tourists should go down to Mexico. You know, something had just happened, some you know big drug thing or government thing or something. Yeah. And they said no, no tourists should go down to Mexico. Only if you have official business that you'll be escorted by official, you know, official security. Official mass man of the wrestling lucha libre. Right. All everybody yeah. else should should stay. And I was like, huh. You know how long it took me to save up to get this ticket? You know, I'm not going to give up my ticket. I'm not going to get a refund on it. You know, there's going to be change fees involved and all this. I can't. I can't do that. So I, I disregarded that warning. Yeah, that's and, exactly and, right. Okay. Kids, there's what you learn here. Never allow a ticket, a non-refundable ticket, not to be used, even if the government tells you your life may be in danger. So that's what you did, right? That's what I did, that's yeah. That's what you did because you believed and. How long were you in Mexico total training, and would you do it again? Oh, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Um, I, I was down there the first time for a month or six, no, the first time for six weeks I was down there. Mm-hmm. And then by, by about the end of the six weeks was when I was finally getting, you know, making connections and figuring things out. Uh, I mean, earlier than that, but, and then they, and they, they I wouldn't go home because they kept saying, um, well, you should just be a beer model or something. And I was taking, I was going to the matches. That was four days a week. They had matches, and then I was going to, I was on a judo team down there as what well. What the hell's so a beer? What the hell's a beer model? Well, I said, no, I want to get in there and I want to do this. I said, if, if yeah. you know, maybe we can trade, maybe some training for, oh. for beer model for ring card girl or, or oh, whatever. But okay, I got you. I want to get in there and do it. Yeah. And so. Uh, finally, they believed me after six weeks of not missing a show. You know, four four times a week, I was there in the front row. Were you making any money? Oh no, 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 no! I was just down you're there. Just, you're just down there on savings. Yeah, well, and then that's uh, scary. They uh, they they said, okay, well, if you come back, we'll we'll hook you up with training. And so then I went back, and then I saved up again, and then I went down for about three weeks and just kind of just got an intro, just got my um, crash course into wrestling there at the CMLL school and then there i met several foreigners who are americans or canadians telling me where a lot closer places are that i could go to further my training yeah where'd you go after that after mexico after mexico there was an nwa and cherry hill new jersey anniversary show Ah. i went there and then from there i met several um regional you know independent workers and um Ex superstars and everything there, and got found some training in North Carolina, found some training in Chicago. Just you know, I would anywhere I could go, I, I would just you know, if I could get there in time for the match, I would go and we get there early and train around in the ring and, and just you know keep baby stepping ahead. Early twenties, right then? Yeah. 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 Hey, uh, tell people what it's like to come into a meeting with good old Jr. back in the talent relation days when you're looking for work. Was I turd? Was I was that a tool? Was that a bad administrator? Because I never really remember uh, I, everything specifically. Uh, you know, someday when I write a book, I'm going to have to call you guys, like you know, uh, Uncle Zeb on some show. Uh, not not Dutch, not Zeb Coulter, but some <laughs> o- o- Uncle Joe. You know, in Hooterville, somebody well, like that. That's how I feel. Writing the speech, I've had fans remind me. I was like, "What are your favorite Lita moments?" And they're reminding me of things. I'm like, "Oh yeah." Yeah, so, I know. so yeah, you uh, can. I can tell you what I remember. And no, we, can, we can piece this, these life stories together. Yeah, I think. good. Thank you so much. You helped me out there. But no, I, I, you guys. Uh, it was. It's funny, you know, as as being hired and seeing, in all of these upper upper management in different states of casual or you know, you get to talking on a personal level. But no, at that time, I really believed you and Bruce Pritchard as a very authoritative team that kind of held my future in the palms of your hand. Very, you know, like a very, like a straight up business team. You, yeah. you, you pulled it off. Yeah, Bruce was. I was, a, but I was a serious one of the team. No, so you were the straight man for sure. <laughs> and Bruce did what he did best. Bruce was a Bruce liked creative better, you know. He, so he, he soon uh, Van Moose from uh, talent relations, and uh, I assumed the reins to the runaway train of. Eight horses, wild horses running. Yeah, you were the uh, the masthead of the Misfit Toys yeah. big ship. The crappiest job in the history of the business is being in charge of talent relations. Trust me, kids. Uh, w- real quick thought. One, some fan, a lot of fans ask about, and I thought I forgot about this a little bit. Uh, S. A. Rios, 
that was was that how we that how we, your first book essay with you and essay Rios or you was valet or what was that? I can't remember. I definitely remember that one. Um, yeah, I was a, a fan of his. I watched him down in Mexico when I was down there training. He was Mr. Aguila there, and he had worked some with the Super Astro Show as Papi Chulo, and yeah, they wanted yeah. to repackage him, mm-hmm. and decided to put us together, which was about my you know a dream come true as far as me you know, coming down to Mexico and then getting to do this yeah. Lucha Libre influenced thing to, to come on to the scene. But little did you know, it, it wasn't your dream come true. It was still yet to be born. <laughs> they were, yeah, it was over and over again. It still, oh, yeah. It was. But he was a uh, colorful guy. I think, did you know that uh, fur coat or that? Well, yeah, that was, yeah, that was when he was in Super Astros. He had the fur coat, and yeah. then we just did the all all red thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was how it all kind of got started, and I thought that was. I think that's just good. And it, it evolved. You know, before we move to your career, looking real quickly at some of these, what's your vision or your impression, I should say, your evaluation, more specifically, of today's women's wrestling scene, whether it be the divas in WWE or women's wrestling in TNA or elsewhere. Uh, I don't. Know, I don't really know the di- difference in a diva and a WWE and a women's wrestler is, except. Uh, marketing. But nonetheless, what's your overview? Yeah, I mean, this isn't even trying to get out of it. I'm just, I'm so far removed these days from what's going on in, in the current. I can get that. You no. know, either WWE or mm-hmm. TNA programming. Yep. I mean, I'm happy to sit and watch a match and tell you if I thought it was good or not. But I, I mean, I just, I just don't. So I can't really. Well, uh, that Nicaragua lifestyle kid will get you in trouble every damn time. You start missing raw, then look what happens to your life. There you go. Yeah, I'm perfectly happy over here. So, and I like popping in for a, you know, a 15th anniversary show or a 3,000th episode or, or whatever they're on, you know, or yeah. WrestleMania. I'm sure. Pop in and and reflect and enjoy. But I'm I'm also really happy where I am here. I'm glad that you're reflecting. We're going to reflect more uh, with my guest this week. She's a 2014 WWE Hall of Fame inductee, and. Uh, I really, uh, one of my all-time favorites, I'll just have to admit, here on the podcast, she is. We have great sponsors in this company that keep us alive. Because I cut to the chase. I don't give you any soft sell BS. If you don't have sponsors and you're not good to your sponsors, then you don't have a show. So let's not kid ourselves. We have great sponsors that I have worked with personally and I think are perfect fits for what we do. We're going to be back with Amy after a word from the best sponsors in the whole wide world. Back with Lita, Amy Dumas, uh, 2014 WWE Hall of Famer, uh, going into uh, the Hall of Fame this year in uh, New Orleans. That's going to be a big night. I can't wait to see that. And uh, I, got some, I got some Twitter questions for you. And I, I really I did my best to call through them, but some of them were, were too provocative not to uh, use. So... How important was the leadership in the women's locker room during your early days of the Attitude Era uh, in WWE? Huh, that's a pretty random question you don't get asked every day. Uh, I was, it's, it's funny that, you know, it's, as far as what I, can, what I do know from, from wrestling now, or I mean, it's been quite a while since I left at this point, mm-hmm. but there was a very defined pecking order in the locker room when I got there, and it was very understood, and it wasn't... You, it, it was deserved, so you didn't feel as though it yeah, was, yeah. you know, snotty or anything. Like it's just the way it was, and, and it and it worked. And you were respectful of everybody's space, and you knew that you were the new kid, and you put your bags in the corner, and you know, and it and it it just helped, you know. And then because a level of a pecking order and a level of respect was there that came along with experience, then they were also, you know, you showed them that you respected that. So then when you went to go ask for advice or you asked the question, you're going to get, you know, m- more likely a helpful answer than somebody, you know, potentially feeding you the wrong information because you put your makeup all over their stuff or you, you laid your costume on top of their suitcase or, you know, wh- whatever. These things that are essentially no big deals, but it, it's what it shows that it does. It shows a lack of respect for people that were there before you. So no issues with that. Would, see, some people in today's marketplace would consider that hazing. I don't. I think so. No, I don't either. It's, it's, but because the thing is, you know, it's like common courtesy is yeah, not so common. I, I agree. It's a rite. Right, it's a right of passage. You know, it's a it's a unique business. We got to admit that there is a fraternity in it. We have to. We know that. 
and uh, you, it's just a, it's it becomes your life for a while, not and not just your job. And speaking of that, uh, what were your thoughts on the uh, another Twitter question? The Matt Hardy Edge TV storyline. The the uh, Twitter person wants to know if it was too close to home. Oh, absolutely, it was. It was very hard to come to work every day. It was probably the darkest period of my life. Absolutely. Really. Absolutely. Wow. Did you express that to anybody? Did you tell me that? Or did uh, you just do your job? Yeah, yeah. Was, I made my bed. I had to lay in it. It'd be I remember very... girls in the locker room going, oh, you look so great. You're so skinny. I'm like, yeah, I have an ulcer. I don't eat. I'm miserable. Wow. And then TV and having to perform and go to the ring in front of all the fans just made it even exasperated the whole situation. Oh, yeah. I mean, th- think think about, I mean, I was. I feel like I was walking my dog on my day off and somebody would open their window up and yell, you screwed Matt. You know, I mean, it was, there was no escaping it anywhere. It was pretty awful. Now, that that becomes really freaky. You know, that would be like me seeing Woody Harrelson and asking him how the stab wound in his stomach came, is healing from True Detective. I'm not there yet, so don't, yeah. <laughs> I'm only on episode five. Oh, so. God. <laughs> well, I didn't say he died. Okay, and, right. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> hey, it's a hell of a, you're going to love, I'll tell you this, you are going to love episodes five through eight. So I said, we'll, we'll stop there with that. Did you have any uh, uh, second thoughts on the creative when they did the bed in the ring live sex show for Raw? Uh, I had uh, uh, 8,000 the... thoughts, but they weren't going to mean anything because once Vince has his mindset on something, there was I, there was no option there. Other than leaving the building, there was no option. Yeah. Hey, it could have been worse. You could have had to rehearse with him. Okay. All right. Just way to look on the bright side. Well, you know, it's just an idea. This is a comedy. It's my attempt at comedy. Somebody on a writing team will tell Vince, you, you know what JR said on his podcast? Or then the, then the story will go. So here we go. So, uh, yeah. the Hey, when I saw that on the script uh, that Lawler and I are going to broadcast a live sex show, I knew that he was more like Larry Flint than I. Because he's the king, but I was just trying to figure out how the hell's a how do you call a live sex show other than lay out? Just yeah, a lot of laying out. I lay out. God damn it. How many rehearsals did that take? Did, we, uh, did, they, did, did they do bring the bed to the ring that day and all that? I I, I think my memory is a little hazy here. It's kind of <laughs> we're gonna have to have other people piece that one together. I all think right. it's just kind of it's not that, it's not that important. It was a lot. The live sex show came off. It got a good rating, didn't it? Or did it? I thought it, it did. absolutely did. I don't even know if it's been beat since. It was an extremely high rating. High rating. Well, there you go, kids. So, I mean, you know. Live sex show does it, it every there's time. There's that. And, you know, the, and as much as you want to argue sometime, the boss usually knows what he's doing. Yeah, you know, he, so. does, he does. He does. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, he gave me a black hat. It's been my gimmick ever since. And I've always said, if you got no talent, you got to have a gimmick. So I got a black hat. It's easy. Easy to figure out. Don't do, don't overthink this stuff. It's crazy. Uh, the uh, I asked Trish this, and in general, looking back on the past, if you could, you know, retrace your steps, what advice, or you know, retrace your steps, but what advice would you give a a young woman in the business today about dating a wrestler? For some reason, Twitter people want to know what you guys think about dating wrestlers. I mean, I, I do feel to an extent it can be unavoidable because your your life is just, you're just inside this bubble and you have these people around you that are also in this bubble and it's very hard to get outside of it because yep, you're yep. on the road 300 days a year. You're living this really crazy life that can be really hard for a normal person to, to even relate to or to identify with. Yep. So I absolutely understand how it happens, but it usually ends a little messy. I saw on Discovery Channel the other night where a man gets horny every 30 minutes so if you were in a bubble with a man and you work with him every day and you guys working 300 days a year or so close to it give or take give or take i get it folks don't get crazy in the dirt sheet now but you they work 300 days a week a year because they travel it all counts you're gone from home trust me 300 days ain't too damn far off so you're with us uh these guys it's not, it, you can't help it really unless you're married to create a relationship. Who else, sure. are you, who else are you around, for God's sakes? 
You know, I used to, have to talk to talent about their wrestling relationships. God almighty, I felt like Dr. Effing Phil. For sure. For well, sure. Yeah, your talent relations. Yeah, part. I heard of all. He's broke my heart, and I found these pictures on his phone, and he, you know, he's bought his girlfriend a new boob job, and God, wait a minute, he what? You know, hold on, I don't, do I need to know this really? Is this really important for me to hear? It's crazy. So, in any event, let's move on to something more positive. Uh, they end up crazy. Good statement. Sometimes they end up crazy. Uh, uh, can you? Is there any experience that you had? I get this all the time, and I hate this question, so I'll ask you because I'm a sadist, I guess. Oh, good. Yeah, do you have a favorite moment? Just an absolute, this was absolute without a question, shout it out. This was my favorite moment in WWE. I can't answer that question. No, I mean, I could rattle off 10, you know what I mean? But no, it's... I can't either. I had a, I, that means I had a great time there. I, I, made, I made great money there. I made retirement money there. Uh... As, a, as my buddy tells me all the time, Jr. there ain't nothing like mailbox money. And he's right. So we both had great experiences there. I, I You did well there, I know. And, uh, you know, he had not just in the ring, but, I mean, you financially did well. So that's good. Did you have a favorite opponent? That's hard to answer uh, because you, you think you're going to piss everybody off that you don't mention. No, it's not that at all. It's especially, too, because I had so much – uh, integral work with the guys that weren't technically opponents, but people that I worked with. Mm-hmm. So that's like, you know, all in one category. But as far as uh, one-on-one matches, it would be Trish. Yeah. That's what most people remember. You know, did you realize the how groundbreaking it was uh, at the, when you and Trish uh, closed Raw in the coveted main event spot? Did you think at that time, hey, man, we're doing, we've done pretty good here. We, we're kind oh, of, yeah. We're kind of we, we knew that day when they told us. We knew, we knew what a big deal that was, and we also knew what big shoes we had to fill. And you know, but, but also at the same time felt like we had the knowledge and talent development. You know, our characters were – we were able to hold that spot too. Yeah, yeah, so, you, yeah, we knew what a big deal it was but, and, and respected the spot that it was, but we're ready to go out there and do it. I tell people this all the time. You know, you're getting cast in a role in a very physical, fictional presentation. Your key word here, folks, cast in a role. So uh, you get cast as uh, Lita and Trish did in their rivalry in a specific role. Then you must go out and execute it to the level that people want to see it more, see more of it. People at that point wanted to see so much of it, it closed raw with a great rating and a great groundbreaking accomplishment. Then you broke ground again, as I, th- I think this is right, in the first ever Divas Cage match with Lisa, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a hell of a deal there too. Uh, women bouncer. I, I I won't tell you this. I I seen I seen a lot of crazy things in my time. You know, wrestling bears and you know donkey basketball games. Seriously, uh, that, that <laughs> yeah. wasn't in Tijuana, by the way. It was for a fundraiser. I I felt uncomfortable calling the cage match with the women in it, and maybe it's just the old guy in me. I don't know, but I. I felt for you guys. Well, that cage just that cage just doesn't care what your gender is. No, it doesn't. Unforgiving, as you've said several times, that is that is real. And you and you uh, and you and you did that. It was pretty. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, someone asked me to quiz you about the storyline involving yourself, Kane, and Snitsky, and I uh, I didn't tell them. I didn't answer them back. But I thought I wrote myself a note. I forgot this one. What the hell was that about? You, Kane, and Snitsky. You know? I, I gave Snitsky his catchphrase for his entire career, which was, it wasn't my fault. Oh. When he smashed my baby with a chair, oh. and I had a miscarriage oh. with my demon spawn inside. My God, the demon spawn's death caused by Snitsky's inadvertent shot. Ladies and gentlemen, the ultimate soundbite and an actuality from the victim, Amy. <laughs> Who lost her demon demon sperm? God Almighty! How could I have forgotten that? That that was that was a great. Maybe you blocked that one out. I might have blocked it out. Could have blocked. Could be blocking. Could be blocking there. Moonsault, your idea, uh, because it really became your signature move. That your did you get that from the Mexican guys, or was this something that you just wanted to do as a female? I got that from uh, the Mexican guys, and 
but yeah, I just it was one of the I just was already doing that on the indies, and it was also one of the moves that Essay Rios was already doing. And when we were doing the mimicking thing, when I was out there with him, it just became the move. And it was the easiest thing to hit when you know a lot of those moves require somebody being really knowledgeable for you to base them, I mean, for them to base you or to, to to interact with you. You don't want someone you don't want it to rely on somebody else to mess up your finish. It's on me. You know, so let me just do something. You just lay there, and I'll do the rest. Boy, boy, what a life that is. Hear that, guys? Just lay there, and she'll do the rest. It'll be a moonsault from the top rope. And it won't... That, that was there. That, I just threw that out there, and I did not mean to, but you had to, you had to take that one, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it was good. That's good. You threw it out there. Uh, you know, you were fearless, did, uh, you, you, but you didn't come out of it unscathed. You were, you were, you were out a long time, the bad neck. Oh, yeah broke it in three places that that one was pretty rough broke my neck in three places as well as tore everything in my knee at uh pay-per-view and that was out i don't know about seven months with that those are the two main ones and that's enough that's enough hey look i have never been a big fan overly a big fan of intergender matches and it's just old school i don't hate them i don't but you were, man, you, you kind of made your reputation in some of those intergender matches, did you not? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you and, and King also being more the traditionalist, we're not a big fan of our intergender matches, but those were definitely some of my favorite matches that we've ever done. There's just so many elements. You can do sexual elements, comedy elements, and then you can also be a real badass interacting with the dudes on a level that you don't normally get to interact. Uh, did, what's more fun, a baby face or heel? They're both different. I loved really being a baby face, but it was fun for me at the end of my career to be a heel because you're really leading the match and you're dictating the pace and you're, you're in control of what's happening. And so that, that was really, it was fun for me to do. And it was fun for me to be able to use the knowledge that I had soaked up along the way to, to be able to do all that. You know, when I first got in the business uh, and I made my first road trip in the territory back in the mid-70s, a guy said, uh, uh, when you get to Baton Rouge, stay at such and such hotel because that's where the heels stay. Because back in those days, you know, the, the uh, baby faces and the heels had to stay at completely different hotels. So in the territory in, uh, where a lot of guys stayed, they, they rented a weekly rate at the, this hotel in Baton Rouge. He said, stay at this hotel because, motel, because the heels have more fun. So I, I didn't really know what that meant, but I soon learned, and, and uh, I could see being a heel was a very inter- if you If you like to express yourself and you like theatrics, being a wrestling heel is pretty damn cool. Well, sure, and then I guess in public or anything else you do, you just can be like, oh, I was just in character. That's right, yeah, rivet on a square, N- known for our business. Who came up with the exposed thong thing? I wrote that myself, actually, because I remember the – you, you just make up some Twitter handle. You're like, these people want to know. Yeah, I, but I, I, I admitted this one. I admitted that I, and I admitted the, the good one. Who came up with the idea of the exposed thong? Was that your? I did. I, I did. It was just I needed an accessory to match my top because I knew I was going to be wearing these baggy pants. So yeah. I just needed some, and uh, you know, something to make my baggy pants with my big knee pads under so I could do my moonsault and it, keep it, my knees protected, and I needed to make it a little more feminine. I got you. Hey, did, did you have to uh, get that approved by the by the home office? I did not. I, I remember I wrestled my first match with that new style, and King came up after he said, you know, that was a really good match, but your underwear was sticking out the whole time. Yeah, said, no, good. I know. I did, I did that on purpose. It matched my top. Good job, Jerry. What do you want to do then? Do you want them or something? Do you, you know? Do you offer you a crown or a, or a signed T-shirt from Graceland for a pair of your underwear? You know the king is Larry Flint. I'm telling you, you got to watch that guy. Hey, uh, I was. I'm not his type. The tattoo just really <laughs> threw him off. Yeah, really. And, and I always said that once uh, his girlfriends reached the uh, age for their driver or their car insurance went down, which I think is 25, that uh, he ceased. He, he started having a declining interest in them at 25. And that was just my own assumption. It's not, ladies and gentlemen, a, a scientific test. It is only an assumption by one individual. If you could have one match, one more match. Boy, would you have one more match, by the way, if it, came, if it was the right deal? Would you have one more match? Could you? Would you want to? What, you know, what, what's the story there? 
Yeah, I mean, if it was the right deal and the right time, yeah, I, I could. I feel great physically. It, I, I, you know, I'd want it to be something that I would be able to have fun doing. Yeah, like WrestleMania, right? I mean, why would you want to do it on the third Thursday of April of Monday Night Raw? I'd want to do it at WrestleMania or something big. SummerSlam. Something, something big. Yeah. I would I would go for, for one more match, yeah. Yeah, something big. Uh, when you decided to leave the WWE, was it burnout? injuries combination thereof or just you want to go on a new adventure you were done a little of the first and a little of the last i no, my body felt fine it was just that i felt as though i'd accomplished everything there was to accomplish as as a woman in my career what i set out to do i felt like it did and at that point it, i could continue to do that I, I got to know how to navigate my job pretty well at that point and it wasn't that difficult uh, um I mean, that being, yes, it was difficult, or, I mean, it hurt. It would hurt getting hit in the face and the travel, you know, but I just become used to the schedule. I knew how to do it, and I could continue to do that for a paycheck, but I didn't get into the business for a paycheck. I got in for an adventure, and it was an adventure, and I, you know, kind of like, I saw what that was, and I just decided I'd rather fall flat on my face on the next adventure and just see what was out there, because it does take up so much of your time. I was missing my friends' weddings and babies being born and all this stuff that I was, as I was inside my bubble. And so I just wanted to, you know, go on the other side. Hey, you know, the thing about it is, is that, uh, you, n- tomorrow's not guaranteed by the way, you know, uh, well, I'm not sounding like an evangelist here, but the fact of the matter is tomorrow's not guaranteed. Today is where you, where you are and you can't change yesterday. So, you know, the bottom line is that, uh, if when you or it's time, it's time, and uh, I can relate to that situation. And we talked about burnout a little bit. And I, what are your thoughts on CM Punk's uh, departure from WWE? Uh, I look at it as a case of I don't know him as well as as I, I w- wish I did because I wasn't around much, but I think he's just burned out. Simple, burned out, and nobody noticed apparently. Right? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. It's hard to. Uh, the challenges of being on the road that the fans see all the happiness and the pyro and the excitement on Monday night. And it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to be a part of, but man, oh man, those Hertz counters and those, 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 mo- those hotel counters and trying to get something to eat and trying to eat clean and find a place to go to the gym and another. Well, I mean, for me and to the big thing is you're, you're always on someone else's time. Yeah. You know, and not even not even including your off days because you'll you know you'll like I said the 48 hours when they didn't call me for the uh, initially to tell me about the Hall of Fame it was like you know what what is happening here I wasn't getting back to them and stuff and so I mean and that's me I don't even work for the company but you know if you're not if you haven't responded within an hour you'll have three more voicemails after so oh. you're you're always mm-hmm. on someone else's time when yeah. you're there yeah well how's the band doing. The Lucha Gores. I love that name, by the way. I should get a I should get a Lucha Gore T shirt. I, I guess we'll see if I could dig any up. That 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 I, that chapter has already come to a close as well. I did we did three U.S. tours, three European tours. Wow. Again, something I was interested in before I wrestled. I was playing in bands, so it was something I just wanted to say that I did and didn't want to know what if I had taken this other path and, and been That's in this cool. band. You you play the bass, right? I play the bass in the band. I just and the, I would play bass and guitar to write the music, and then in the band, I just sang live. Wow, man, you have. Uh, if I'm a producer, you know, if I'm a if I'm a television producer, and I have an ounce of creativity in my body, I would be beating down your door to say, "Hey, we need to do this uh, reality show because what you do is not. Uh, uh, you 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 ain't June Cleaver here." You know, you're a different breed of cat, and I and I'd like to know more about the cat. You know, are you gonna write a book? Are you gonna do any? You gonna document this life that you've had because it is pretty damn unique. It is. You know, they had me do my book um, when I broke my neck in 2002, which was really just the beginning of my career, and I've yeah. got so much more life stories that have happened since. So Man, I if I, if you're interested, you, if you're interested in sh- seriously shopping a book, because that's what I'm doing right now with some people. Uh, I would really endorse uh, anybody I talk to to at least engage you in a conversation to talk about because the the independent woman side of you is absolutely phenomenal uh, that you you know you 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 try things 
you have the courage to try things and get outside your comfort zone. And I said a million times that people that live in their comfort zone are, are starting to, to, they're starting to perish. Because if you ain't living, you're dying. It's real simple. I do, too. I don't know any other way. There you go. There you go. Listen, I'm proud of you. Thank you for taking time to be on our program. Uh, and uh, you're a uniquely talented woman. And, and I think this has, a, as I said, an, an enviable, independent spirit. And I, uh, I, I hope that uh, other young women that listen to this or people that hear this will suggest young women listen to it because it just shows if you got the, if you got the courage and the willpower that just about anything is possible because you've kind of shown that to me. Well, and yeah, and guys, guys can listen too, and then they can also go out and do things too. I don't, I don't just, I'm not exclusive to females. Well, that's another story for now. That's a whole other show, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, and I'm laying them out for you. What am I doing here? I need to, I need yeah. to make some more bullet points. Yeah, you know, I, I, you laid me some softballs up that I used to do for Lawler, and I just didn't. Some of them I just backed away from, but I. Hey, look, I enjoyed the visit. It's a little irreverent, and I want to keep it that way. It's uh, shooting the breeze. And I like that. Uh, and uh, we, I appreciate you indulging me tonight. And I hope to see you in New Orleans. If you're there early, come see my show. I'll get you. I got, I got, I got people. It's on thir- yeah. Thursday night at the House of Blues, and you're always welcome. Bring, bring friends. Open. All right, there. Well, hopefully I'll see you in New Orleans. I'm proud of you. I really, truly am. I, I'll never forget that day in, in the office, and and uh, I could tell that you, you radiated passion. You, this was something you had to try, and I'm sure glad that we all agreed that it was the right thing to do. So congratulations, and I'll see you down in New Orleans. All right, JR. Sounds good. Thanks. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.